2022 is a big year for video game 35th anniversaries. Street Fighter, Mega Man, Final Fantasy, Metal Gear, Contra, Double Dragon, Platoon, okay, maybe not that last one. My point is 1987 was a massive year for video games. But the importance of that year extends far beyond just cartridges and controllers. Because in December of 1987, the very first episode of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon aired. And while the comic that show was very loosely based off of originally released three years before that, make no mistake, it was this cartoon that kicked off a global phenomenon that would continue for decades, all the way into the modern era. So today, we're going to celebrate this legendary franchise in the only way I know how. By taking the cast and thinking of ways they could beat the snot out of each other. You know, when I phrase it like that, it doesn't really sound all that fun. It sounds more disturbing. Maybe I should really rethink this whole show and seek professional help. Whoops! No time for self-reflection, the intro's starting! And welcome to Build the Roster, the show where we take a hypothetical fighting game and build our dream roster around it. And as I said, this year is the 35th anniversary of the original Ninja Turtles cartoon, but the Turtles didn't end their influence at just this series. They've spawned multiple other cartoons, long-running comics that have actually been really impressive, several movies that... well, some of them were alright, a live stage tour that... Okay, listen, not everything the Turtles have done have been good. And speaking of varying quality, video games! Yes, the Ninja Turtles have had a long, long line of video games, and recently they've returned to the digital domain with the release of the excellent beat-em-up Shredder's Revenge. And later this year, we're going to get the incredible Cowabunga collection that gathers together more than 10 classic games including all three versions of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters. And I am so happy that people will once again have a chance to play this game. I remember when I was a kid, I would rent this thing from the video store every chance I could get. And after going back and replaying the game recently, I gotta say, it actually holds up way better than you might think. I mean, sure, it still has a lot of that early 90s fine game jankiness to it, but compared to most other fine games of the time, or heck, especially to any other licensed video game of the time, it's actually a fairly well-made game. And that's not the only good news Tournament Fires has seen recently. Over the past few years, a very talented team of developers have put together a Mugen by combining the sprites from Tournament Fighters and Justice League Task Force to make the fan game TMNT Cross Justice League and this thing has exploded in the fine game community. People have called it one of the best Mugens ever. It's gotten in-game artwork from SNK legend Nona, and this year it was even featured as an official game at Combo Breaker, one of the biggest fighting game tournaments on the planet. So, with this sun resurgence of love for tournament fighters, and with the Turtle Star still going strong after all these years, maybe now would be a good time to make a sequel. I mean, heck, the developers of Shredder's Revenge even used tons of classic fighting game moves for the characters in that game. You've got a development team just sitting right there who would be perfect to make this thing. If there was any time for this thing to come into existence, it'd be now. So today, we're going to pretend like somewhere out there, a sequel to this fan-favorite fighter is in the works. A brand new Ninja Turtles fighting game is coming your way, and it's up to us to build that roster. Now, first thing we always have to do is figure out how big the roster is going to be, and I'm going with 22 characters. Why 22? Because the last two fighting games the Ninja Turtles appeared in were Injustice 2 and Nick All-Star Bell, and the first Injustice game has a starting roster of 24, and Nick All-Stars has a starting roster of 20, halfway between 24 and 20 is 22, bing, bang, boom. But that's not the biggest question with today's episode. I announced we'd be doing this episode all the way back at the very beginning of the year, and since then, there's one question that I've gotten more than any other. What version of the Turtles are we going to base this roster around? 
A fair question, considering there have been multiple different versions of the Turtles, and each of them have had such huge cast of characters that you could easily build a fine game around any of them. So, should we use the classic cartoon, the 2003 cartoon, the 2012 cartoon, Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the next mutation? Okay, now you guys know I'm messing with you. Well, the answer is... None of them. The idea I'm working around here today is that this game will have its own continuity where pretty much anything from the Turtles history is on the table. I'm going with this approach for a few reasons. One, because the moment you say this game is built specifically around the continuity of one specific interpretation, you then limit yourself to the characters only from that interpretation. And where's the fun in that? Plus, if we base it around one specific interpretation, then it might turn off some of the people not familiar with that series. Oh, this is based off of the 2003 cartoon? Oh, well, I haven't seen that one, so suddenly I'm less interested. And some people even suggested that we should just do a big crossover between all the series, which on some level makes sense. I mean, crossovers are fun, and the Turtles already did their own Into the Turtleverse long before everyone else was jumping on the multiverse bandwagon. But when we open the door to multiple versions of the same character, then the roster starts filling up way faster with far less variety. You can ask Dragon Ball Fire's Oops All Goku Edition what that's like. So no, we're not doing a big crossover, this roster is going to be set completely within its own continuity. Meaning anyone can get into this game. Plus, the Turtles, listen, they're superheroes who have been around for almost 40 years with similar stories and characters made over and over and over again for new generations. It just makes sense not to focus on one specific interpretation for them. When a new Spider-Man or Batman game comes out, you don't ask, oh, is this set in the comic universe, or is it set in the cartoons, and which cartoon is it going to be set in? No, you know it's going to be its own thing. So everyone is on the table. That means characters from the cartoons, from the games, from the movies, and especially from the IDW comic. Yeah, in case you are a Turtles fan, but you pretty much just focus on the cartoons and the movies and the games, and you're not aware that this thing exists, I'm going to take a moment real quick and plug a major recommendation. Check out the IDW Ninja Turtles comic. Heck, even if you're not a Turtles fan and you're just watching this video because it came up in autoplay and you don't feel like turning it off, I'm still going to make this recommendation. Check out the IDW Ninja Turtles comic. It's been going on for over 10 years at this point with a story that's continuously built throughout the entire run, with characters significantly growing and changing over that time, and it's one of the only times I've ever seen someone do the whole we're taking something made for kids and aging it up and making it darker and more mature, and actually made it work. It feels more serious while holding on to the magic of what made the turtle so fun and special in the first place. And it's even supervised by Kevin Eastman, one of the original creators of the Turtles. So it's even got some old school credentials for everything. I totally recommend checking it out, and yes, I will be referencing it multiple times throughout today's video because the stories and characters in there are so good and important to the history of the Turtles, I think they deserve to be brought up. Also, it doesn't hurt that unlike the cartoons and movies, I can show as many examples of these characters from the comics as I want without having to worry about getting a copyright claim, so... That might also have something to do with it, but it's mostly because the stories and characters are really good and you should all check it out. But all right, that's enough setup, so put on your favorite colored mask, grab a warm slice of pizza, and everybody give me your best <laughs> because it's finally time to build that roster. Leonardo, Donatello, Michelangelo, and Raphael. Yeah, normally in these videos I like to tackle one character at a time, so that way it keeps you all in suspense about what character could be coming up next, but are you kidding me? Of course the four Ninja Turtles are going to be in our Ninja Turtles fighting game. Can you imagine if we put out a TMNT fighting game and only three of the Turtles were in here? Yeah, sorry guys, we got Leo and Mikey and Raph, but there was this weird legal issue around Donnie. But don't worry, we got one of the punk frogs in here to cover for him, you'll never notice. So yeah, we got the four turtles in here, nothing more needs to be said, so let's just move on to- Uh-uh, no, 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 hold on, hold on, just one minute. Oh, hey everybody, it's fighting game YouTuber and streamer Ignit Rizzi, what are you doing here? Keeping you from making a big mistake? <laughs> Listen. I'm a big TMNT fan, and I will not just let you say the turtles are in the game and just leave it at that. There's so much more to cover, like, you know, 
their play styles. You got four different turtles here, all with different weapons and completely different personalities. So you know they have some type of variety to them. So how about you let the audience know how each of them will play? Well, I could do that, but then everyone might realize that I actually know nothing about fighting games and my entire channel is a lie. Say what now? I said I could do that, but since you're here and you're the guest and you're such a big Turtles fan, how about you take a crack at it? Oh, big bet, my pleasure. So in that case, let's start off with the fearless leader, Leonardo. He's the most dedicated, he's the most serious, he's a real straight arrow who spends his time training and improving his skills. He's probably more Ryu than Ryu will ever be. So yeah, let's make him an all-arounder. Give him attack, defense, and speed that are all just right down the middle. It'll definitely match his attitude, and it'll be perfect for that leader that holds the whole team together. Yeah, you're not wrong there. Even back in the day, Leo was the most all-rounder of all-rounders. Check out his stat sheet from Team NT Turtles in Time. Well, damn, you don't get any more well-rounded than that. Now, as for his moves, he got his source for decent range, but not too much. He could throw a shuriken for a projectile or have a jumping kick to close the distance, but he wouldn't be a zoner or a rushdown. He's got a little bit of everything, but not enough to specialize in anything. Sort of like a jack of all trades, but a master of none type of thing. This would make him the character that would be great for anyone just starting the game or learning the essentials. I mean, if there's any character out there who just screams, I care about fundamentals, it's Ryu. I mean, Leonardo. I'm totally keeping that in the video. <laughs> now, as for his brothers, that's when we start getting a little more specific. First up, we have Donatello, who will be the zoner of the family. His weapon is a bow staff, so all of his basic attacks will have a good reach. And as the song says, Donatello does machines. He's a tech wizard, so you can give him a whole bag of gadgets to pull out. He can toss bombs across the screen, give him a super science backpack loaded with weapons, or just give him his staff from Rise of the TMNT and let him shoot lasers and let him fly all over the screen. Speaking of Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I figure the turtles in this game will probably have designs that more closely resemble the standard look that everyone is used to, but we could easily give them alternate costumes to resemble how they looked in Rise of the Turtles since so many people enjoy that show. Yes, or the black and white cell shaded costumes to make them look like the original comics. Yeah, or their Foot Clan outfits from the comics. Or the movie designs. Or those dancing rock and roll outfits from their stage show. Yeah, nah, we're not doing that. Yeah, I instantly regret that one as soon as I said it. Now, since Donnie fights from a distance, the idea would be to keep the opponent away from you, meaning he had the lowest defense of the four. But the character with the highest defense would be, of course, my favorite of the bunch, Raphael. He'd be the big tank of the team. He's a character who just swings and hits hard, but of course, he has to be right in your face to do so. I mean, Raphael had the shortest weapons and the shortest temper on his team, so of course he wanted to fight up close and personal. And to pull that off, we could give him some specials or moves with armor, as well as a few grabs, making him a borderline grappler. Oh hell, it'll be like that version of Rat from that one TMNT game from 2013 that we don't talk about. You know, the one that came out on Xbox, PS3, and Steam. Remember that? Holy crap, I spent the last month researching everything that has to do with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and even I forgot this game existed. Okay, but anyway, you want to get a really deep cut in there? Give him two grab moves, that big slam and the screen toss from the old TMNT beat em up games. So he'd be pretty deadly up close, but to balance him out, he would easily be the slowest of the team. So who would be the fastest turtle? Venus de Milo. Wow. So you're just really out here trying to lose subscribers right now, huh? Hey, I had to bring up Venus somewhere in here, otherwise the whole comment section would just be full of people making the same what about Venus joke over and over again. Also, before anyone mentions it, yes, Venus in the IDW comics is actually kind of cool. She's this creepy zombie Frankenstein creature who could actually be fun to include in this game, but she's only been like four issues so far, so no, we're not going to include her today. I'm sorry, what were we talking about? I mean, Frank and Venus is pretty cool. But anyway, for those of you out there who can actually do process of elimination, yeah, we're obviously talking about Michelangelo. So Mikey will be the rushdown character of the team. For starters, he uses nunchucks, a weapon that's designed to smack you around multiple times in a row. So have him be a character who gets in close and starts off long chain combos with many of his normals easily linking together. And Mikey is also super agile. As a party dude, he's known for his quick footwork and his smooth moves. So let's give him plenty of specials that let him jump around, flip around the stage, and completely mix up the opponent. Think of a character like Rashid in Street Fighter V, where he can cancel a flip 
into another attack. That's the level of mobility I'm thinking for Michelangelo. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, all four turtles. You got the all-arounder, the zoner, the tanky grappler, and the rushdown. Meaning all the turtles will fight completely differently in ways that will reflect their personalities. Because if you want to make a turtles game, you got to make sure you show off their personalities. Hey, thanks, Rizzy. Now that we got all that established, this roster's off to a good start. So before you head off, how about you tell everyone out there where they can find you? What's up, everybody? I'm Ignor Rizzy, and I make videos on a variety of different fighting games. You can find me on YouTube, on Twitch, and on Twitter, all at Ignor Rizzy. I'm pretty sure Thor will link you down in the comments or description. Whatever's easier for people to actually read. Eh, it's YouTube. They're going to make it impossible to find anything on this site, no matter where I put it. But yes, follow Rizzy, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us and helping us out with this video. And now that we got the four obvious choices out of the way, that means we got 18 characters left, and we can start getting into the really interesting choices. Interesting choices like... Splinter, Shredder, April O'Neil, and Casey Jones. Again, I'm just going to tackle all these characters at once, simply because, just like with the four turtles, there is no surprise here. If you're making a TMNT fighting game, these are the four characters who have to be in there. They're some of the only characters to be in every single interpretation of the turtles. They're like the lighthouse in Bioshock. There must always be a splinter, there must always be an April. So again, rather than making you all wait in anticipation, let's go ahead and address how they would play. Splinter is the turtle's master. He's all about teaching his student. So, I say we load him up with tons of counters. Make him a character that doesn't really go to the opponent, he more of waits for the opponent to come to him. Picture it like you're the sensei, teaching your students how to attack, and then you punish them if they get it wrong. Give him a grab that flips you into the air to set you up for a combo, a roll that lets you slide and go past projectiles. He'd be a character with a few offensive options, but lots of ways to punish you that can lead into big combos. This would make him a character that would be very hard to learn, but as I said, he's a wise old master. If you want to play as him, you need to study up. As for Shredder, he'd be the exact opposite. Rather than focusing on defense, he would focus on offense. Shredder is one of the most iconic cartoon villains, so you want to make him really intimidating. And to me, intimidating translates into pressure. Make him a very unga bunga character who once he starts attacking, keeps attacking. He would be a fighter who just overwhelms the other player with so many damaging attacks, causing your opponent to be afraid to counterattack because they knew that if they screwed up, their life bar would just vanish. I mean, think about the first time that the Shredder faces the Turtles in almost any cartoon or comic or other interpretation of that story. No matter what version of the story you're talking about, it typically results in the Turtles getting stomped down and then coming back completely terrified of this new threat. So, in this game, you want Shredder's attacks to feel so powerful that they would put your enemy in that same state. Next up, Casey Jones, the lovable hockey enthusiast who just started beating people up one day and never stopped. Casey is another character who pretty much focuses all of his energy on attacking, but he's not as well trained as the Shredder. No, Casey was a guy who picked up some hockey sticks and whatever else he found laying around and just went to town. So Casey is far more reckless. He's not afraid to go right into danger and get the snot kicked out of him if it means taking out the bad guy with him. And he fights with whatever he can find, so I say we combine that together to make him a very risk and reward type character. Let's give him a mechanic where the more damage he takes, the stronger he gets. Not so much in terms of raw physical power, it's not like he would do more damage, but more in terms of abilities. Let's say you get down to two thirds of your health and now you would unlock some new moves. Then you get down to your final third, and you unlock even more moves. Basically, the idea is that the more damage that you take as Casey, the more stuff he just starts randomly pulling out of that big double bag of his to fight back with. And lastly, April O'Neil. This was a no-brainer. She's the Turtles' closest ally, she's been there with them from the very beginning. This was obvious. What wasn't obvious, though, is how she would play. Not because it wouldn't be easy to interpret her into a fighting game, but because what version of April should we go with? As I said, we're going to have a whole new separate continuity for this game. This isn't based around the old cartoons or the recent cartoons or the movies or the comics. It's just based on Ninja Turtles, because every version of the Ninja Turtles has enough in common that you could find some common ground between them in order to merge it all together. Shredder is basically the same in every version. Splinter is basically the same in every version. Everyone is basically the same in every version. Except for April O'Neil. April has been a news reporter, a down-on-their-luck teenager, a scientist, a ninja, a psychic alien experiment, and Megan Fox. 
Every version of April O'Neil is completely different. So what is our April going to be like? Well, for this one, I'm going with a more classic interpretation. I think that despite all these different versions of the character, her original report persona is the one that most people think of when they picture April O'Neil. I mean, heck, this was the version of April that was playable in that Nickelodeon fighting game. Despite the fact that Nickelodeon has made two different versions of April themselves, and this wasn't either of them. Plus, if we go with the news reporter persona for April, that would make her moveset completely different from any of the other characters. We could actually make it kind of similar to Ron Hibiki from Rival Schools, and no, I am not just saying that because I love Rival Schools and will look for any excuse to bring it up. I'm saying that because you want to make sure that your characters are loaded with personality in your fine games. And April smacking people with a microphone, snapping foes of them to stun them, it would make her feel completely unique among all the other fighters in this roster. Heck, you could even mix some Phoenix Wright mechanics in there and let her investigate to find clues that would give her a scoop, which would basically be a way of giving her a temporary buff depending on what clue you found. You could really make April one of the most standout characters in this game if you lean away from the ninja skills and superpowers and mourn to her being a reporter. Okay, we're finally done with all the basics, which means now it's time for the big surprises. Guys? <laughs> Dude, bring back the Mohawk. Good for you. Oh, oh y'all got jokes, huh? But let's see how funny you are after we bash your hands in. Okay, fine. Maybe big surprises was a bit overselling it, but it actually is worth clarifying that Bebop and Rockstay were not givens going into this game. Yeah, Shredder's top mutant henchmen were some of the most iconic villains from the original series. But after that, they went away for a long time. They weren't in the movies, they weren't in the 2003 cartoon, heck, they weren't even in the original tournament fighters outside of background cameos. So yeah, we have to correct that and actually put them in here now. They'd both be two of the hardest hitting characters in the game, and again, these aren't characters known for strategy, so they'd be pretty unga bunga as well. With Rockstay being the strongest and having some charge attacks that would allow him to run his horn across the screen with plenty of armor on the attack. Meanwhile, Bebop wouldn't be as strong as Rockstay, but he'd hit a lot faster, pounding away at you with relentless punches or even pulling out some weapons to smack you around. If you read the IDW comic, you know these two do have a lot of love for that sledgehammer and chainsaw of theirs. Heck, you could even make that a super move for Bebop. Let him have a chainsaw install and he just pulls that thing out, revs it up, and now he's just carrying it around for a few seconds and he does major slashing damage. Armagon. Okay, yes, we still got plenty more standard characters that you would expect to be in this game, but I owe you guys an oddball by now. And first one I'm picking is Armagon. This mutant shark from the old comics actually did appear in the first tournament fighter, which is where most people would know him from, and by most I mean all, as he did not actually appear in a TMNT cartoon until the 2012 series where he was voiced by Ron Perlman. A fact I am bringing up because you all need to know that Armagon the Space Shark was voiced by Ron Perlman. But in all seriousness, if this is Tournament Fighter 2, we have to bring back some of the oddballs from the first game. And when I was a kid, my favorite console was the Sega Genesis, but when it came to Tournament Fighter, I wanted to play it on the Super Nintendo. Was it because that was the better version of the game? No. I mean... It was the better version of the game, but I wasn't smart enough to know that when I was a kid. No, I wanted the Super Nintendo version because that was the version with this killer artwork of Donnie fighting Armagon on the cover, and that image was burned into my tiny child brain for life. It was just so cool. So if you want to do something that just screams Tournament Fighters is back, show off a brand new HD version of Armagon duking it out with the turtles. That's going to get some of the old nostalgia nerds to perk up and pay attention.
Metalhead. You know what's better than a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? A Teenage Mutant Ninja Robot Turtle. Yes, Metalhead is a fan favorite, a robot originally created by Donnie, who sometimes helps the turtles out and sometimes gains sentience and becomes a villain because what else is a robot doppelganger going to do? And hey, I think Metalhead is cool. When I was a kid playing Turtles in Time at the arcade and he popped up, I remember having the biggest grin on my face. He'd have a ton of projectile-based weapons. In fact, for his heavy punch, you could have him stretch his entire fist across the screen like Dalsim. And you could even put wheels on his feet for a rolling attack that would allow him to close in on the opponent, giving him pretty good attacks from a distance while also giving him some close range options. Plus, I'd love it if his attacks showed his arms and body parts switching and whirling around like he's pulling out different tools or attachments, just to add some extra flavor to all of his moves. As I said before, in a game like this, you want to make sure that every single one of your characters is just low with personality, and when it comes to Metalhead, there's so much that you could do with just the animation of his robot body that would really make him stand out. Krang. Of course Krang had to be in here. On the list of Big Turtle baddies, he is neck and neck with Shredder. Sometimes quite literally. Now, as for how he'd play, we'd have to give him his big exoskeletal bodysuit, although aesthetically speaking, I would go with the more modern, updated IDW design myself. I just think that's a way better intimidating look than shaved Zangief with a tuning fork on his head. But don't worry, we'll make sure to give him his classic look as an extra unlockable costume. And because of this robot body, he would be the biggest character in the game. I'm thinking close to Hugo or Abigail size from Street Fighter. So a fighter that isn't very fast, but is certainly intimidating with heavy hitting normals. Also, if we're working around the idea that each character would have multiple supers, including some kind of a big cinematic level 3 super, for Krang's big level 3, have him bring out the Technodrome. Don't get me wrong, the Technodrome would also make for a great stage, but if we're talking about what has to be Krang's big ultimate move, seeing this giant tank rolling out and firing on the opponent, that's it. That just screams Krang's ultimate attack. And speaking of really big bruiser characters... Leatherhead. This is another long-running character in the turtle lore, although for this one, I'm going with a more modern take on the character. I mean, I'm sure the classic Cajun Bayou incarnation of him has his fans, but I kind of dig the more savage version that we've gotten in recent cartoons and comics. And that savagery would work into his playstyle very well. Let him whip that tail around, give him a move where he starts running across the stage, chomping at you with his mouth. If you played King of Fighters, I'm borrowing a lot of this from King of Dinosaurs. However, he wouldn't be a grappler like King of Dinosaurs. No, he'd be a little more your standard big bruiser character. But with his tail, he would also have some good variety in there. I mean, the biggest problem with big bruisers is typically gain in on your opponent, so imagine if his low heavy kick caused him to slide his tail across the floor for a sweep attack that would cause the opponent to fall into the ground, giving you a good opportunity to run in and get up close on them. Let's really put that tail to work to give him some coverage that other big tough guys in fighting games tend to lack. Your Wingnut. Wingnut is up there alongside Armagon as one of those characters who might not seem that important to the turtle lore overall. He wasn't exactly a big mover and shaker. Sure, he was in the comics and the cartoons, but he never really left that big of an impact on the overall series. However, he was in the first tournament fighters, and just like Armagon, he's another one of those characters that when you think of tournament fighters, you think of them. Heck, the developers of that TMNT Justice League Mugen sure did. They gave him his own rock and roll stage and it's one of the best stages in the entire game. Plus, I've had a lot of big beefy fighters on this list so far, which is understandable, turning into a mutant rarely slims you down. 
the wingnut is a bat that swoops and slides across the stage, which could make him another great agile rushdown character. Plus, he's kind of nuts. I mean, just look at him. That's not exactly the face of Sandy right there. So you could give him all kinds of moves that let him whip and flip and dip around unpredictably, making him one of the more agile characters in the game and making him very difficult to catch, but more importantly, playing into his personality. Lowly pathetic monstrosities, prepare yourselves! Karai. Another staple of the Turtles, Karai is the daughter of the Shredder, at least in most continuities, and has appeared in almost every version of the comics, almost every TV show, heck, she's even been in several games, including being the boss in the original Tournament Fighters, where she was, if I may say so, insanely overpowered. Karai is one of Shredder's greatest warriors, probably the most ninja of ninjas, and very skilled with a sword. So, she'd be one of the lighter and quicker characters in the game, but to show off her wide range of abilities, let's give her a stance move. I'm not saying make her a stance fighter. Stance fighters are ones who can shift their entire playstyle around. No, I say we put her in a stance where she holds her sword up, and then every single attack button turns into a different attack, giving her tons of options that could surprise your opponent with which attack comes out, and could respond to almost any situation. An attack like that really matches Karai's years of training and deadly abilities. Old Hob. Okay, now we're getting into some characters that might cause some of you to ask some questions. Because Old Hob was an original character created for the IDW comics that I mentioned earlier, and he has never been in anything else. No cartoons, no movies, no games, not even the game that was based on the IDW comics. So why am I including him in here? Because as I said, the IDW comic has been going on for over 10 years at this point. It's had over 100 issues and dozens of miniseries and tie-ins and crossovers. And Old Hob has been the biggest recurring villain of that entire series. He was the very first villain that the characters went up against in that book. He's been behind multiple major plot points since the very start. He even set off a mutagen bomb that... I won't spoil anything beyond that, but it led to one of the biggest status quo changes in Turtle history. So yeah, when you've been that big of a part of the Turtle's life for that long, you deserve to get into a game. But Hobbs... Well, he is a scrapper. He's not afraid to throw down, and he certainly packs a ton of artillery, but he's more of a planner. He actually leads a gang of mutants called the Mutanimals in the comics, so let's make him a bit like Captain Ginyu in Dragon Ball Fighters, and give him some moves where he can summon in his soldiers to come in and attack for him. He can bring out Man Ray to punch the opponent into the air for a combo setup, Herman, a giant hermit crab who carries around a shell full of rocket launchers on his back to shoot a projectile across the stage, or Mondo Gecko to slide across the stage on a skateboard to knock the opponent down, allowing Hobbs to get in close on. So not only is Hobbs a big enough character in the comics that he deserves a chance in this game, but he's also the perfect fighter to provide cameos to other characters who couldn't make it into the roster. Drop the blade, sweetheart. My name is Alopex, Turtle Boy. Alopex. Speaking of characters big in the comics, Alopex was another character created just for the IDW series, but she was actually lucky enough to make it into the 2012 cartoon. However, for this game, we have to go with her white fox look. It's just so much better. The markings on the face, the bandages around the arms, the hood and scarf, it's all just an incredible design. And Alopex, just like Hobbs, has been a major part of the comics since almost the start. She started off as a member of the Foot, then slowly went on a journey of discovery, rebelled against the Foot, became an unlikely ally to the Turtles, then became a vigilante, and now she's practically a member of the Turtle Clan herself, even having a green mask when she goes out fighting beside them, which would be a perfect alternate costume. Listen, I don't need to cover her playstyle much. She's a fox, she's a ninja, she's fast, give her running slash attacks, yeah, 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 yeah. 
What's important is that Alapex is one of the best characters the comics have made for the Turtles, and she needs to be in more stuff. So you better believe I would definitely put her in this roster. I have returned, and I bring with me the most feared assassin in all of Asia. Tiger Claw. Tiger Claw. All right, we've covered two recent characters who originate in the comics, so let's cover a recent character who originated in the cartoons. And by reason, I mean from a decade ago, but when the Turtles are almost 40, the 2012 cartoon is still pretty recent. And now of all the characters introduced in the 2012 cartoon, my number one choice has to be Tiger Claw. Why? Well, he was a big threat in the show, being Shredder's right-hand man and one of the world's deadliest bounty hunters. But I'll be honest with you guys. The real reason why I'm putting Tiger Claw in this game is for admittedly a very dumb reason, but I kind of love it. This is a fighting game, and Tiger Claw is a giant man with an eye patch with tigers as his theme. Just make him Sagat. There's too much of an overlap in there. Just make him Sagat. Give him a rising uppercut anti-air. He's got a laser gun, so give him two different projectiles, one that fires high, one that fires low, and give him a pouncing attack that's meant to kind of resemble the tiger knee. Just make him Sagat. Heck, I'd love to get the voice actors from the shows to come in here and do these characters, but in case we can't get Eric Bowser to come back, hire Sagat's voice actor. You know that voice coming out of this face would just match up. Alright, so that was Tiger Claw. But before we move on to the next character, I'm just going to preface something. My reason for putting Tiger Claw in here might have been weird, but he was not the weird pick. Yes, if you've watched this show for a while, then you know I have many philosophies that I follow when building a roster. Many types of characters that I like to include. And I always say, when you put together a roster, you need the weird pick. You need that one character that makes people say, I'm sorry, what? It helps make your roster feel unique. It helps it stand out. It helps make it different from all the other games out there, and it makes people pay attention. I mean, Ryu is great, but you can't have a roster of just Ryus. You need a Blanca in there. You can't just have the faces. You need the freaks. But in a franchise where a robot from space with a talking brain in its belly is the norm, what exactly is the freaks? Oh, don't worry. Because even in Ninja Turtles, there is still an extreme. So I present to you... The Weird Pick. Mutagen Man. Yes, the most mutant of mutants. This guy isn't even a mutated animal or human turned into an animal. He's a mutant who just dissolved into a sentient pile of goo that is barely being kept together by his containment suit. He's not exactly an important character to TMNT lore, but he has appeared in multiple cartoons and comics. So clearly, he's a big enough face that the creators have decided to keep bringing him back again and again. So let's bring him back again and again! As for how he play, I'm picturing basically a grosser version of Swamp Thing from Injustice. He's got a big stretchy amorphous body that he can manipulate, so let's let him stretch and punch you with his big growing fist and let it grab you and smack you around, or let him send his goopy body down through the cracks in the floor so that comes up behind you and then punches you in the back of the head. That's another reason why you want to include weird characters in your roster, because typically they have playstyles that are very different from anyone else. And yeah, Mutagen Man would feel very different from anyone else. That wasn't any fun. Well, excuse the shell out of me. <laughs> My skull's not having a picnic either. Renette. When you think of the Ninja Turtles, you probably think of fighting mutants in the sewers or ninjas on the rooftops, but I doubt time travel immediately jumps into anyone's minds. Even though it probably should. 
Yeah, from the original Mirage comics to multiple shows to a whole video game based around it, the Turtles are no stranger to time travel. And often, that's thanks to the Time Master from the future, Renette. So, if she's been that big part of the Turtles' history, let's go ahead and make her playable. Also, her powers revolve around time travel, and there is so much you can do with that in a fighting game. Have her do a teleport where she can instantly jump back to where she was two seconds ago on the stage. Have her do a counter where she slows the opponent down, or causes the opponent to move in reverse to retrace their steps in order to get them away from her if they're applying too much pressure. Or have a super where you just freeze them in place for a moment. Renette has always been a fun character, but often she just shows up and says, Hi, Turtles, and then explains time travel to them. It's time she finally got a chance to stand out, and with the crazy amount of moves that you could give her in this game, this is the perfect opportunity for her to take the spotlight. Okay, there's only one more character in this roster. So for this final spot, I'm going to go with a character who has been a major player throughout the Turtles' history. He's been in the comics, he's been in the shows, and he's been in the games, but he's been almost completely different in every single interpretation. Through your eyes, brothers, I finally see the world for what it really is. This city is infested. Eight million parasites. Together, we shall rid this city of humanity and reclaim it for ourselves. <laughs> Rat King. Yes, if you remember the old cartoons, you might remember Rat King as being this super buff crazy man who lived in the sewers with a bunch of rats. And in the original Tournament Fighters, he and Karai were actually the two in-game bosses. Yeah, not Shredder, not Krang, just a guy covered in rags who likes to powerbomb people. But for this game, we're not going with that interpretation. Because over the years, Rat King has kind of come up in the world. In the 2003 series, he was now a super soldier. In the 2012 cartoon, he was a psychic mad scientist who looked like he came from a Stephen King novel. And the IDW comic, he's a god! Yeah, this character went from smelly guy in the sewer to a god. That may be one of the biggest promotions in the history of fictional characters. Yes, in the IDW comics, he's a trickster god who is said to be the basis for the Pied Piper mythos, and he's constantly manipulating events behind the scenes, and that's the version that we'll be using for this game. I like the idea of this game having some throwbacks to the original tournament fighters, so making Rat King the big final boss again would be a clever wink to the original series, except that as I said, yeah, the original Rat King just doesn't feel like he should be the final boss of your fighting game. But the Rat King that is an actual god, that character has got in-game boss status written all over him. Plus, since he's a trickster god and a manipulator, it would kind of be fitting for him to be the one that arranges all the fighting in the first place. I mean, sure, the Turtles have no problem going up against Shredder, but if you want Mikey and Donnie to fight each other, someone's gotta be pulling some strings behind the stage. And there you have your full starring roster for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters 2. Alopex, April O'Neil, Armagon, Bebop, Casey Jones, Donatello, Cry, Krang, Leatherhead, Leonardo, Metalhead, Michelangelo, Mutagen Man, Old Hob, Raphael, Rat King, Renette, Rockstay, Shredder, Splinter, Tiger Claw, and Wingnut. Of course, can't leave out Wingnut. I think that's a pretty good starting roster. 22 characters with a wide selection of old classics, new faces to keep it fresh, some standard fires, and multiple wild cards. But if you've watched this series for long enough, you know we can't stop at the starting roster. No modern day fighting game puts out a roster and says, there you go, that's it, enjoy. No, no. For this fighting game about the TMNT, we gotta talk DLC. Yes, what would a modern day fighting game be without DLC? And if this game got made, then you know they would have some. But how big would the DLC be? Well, we can guarantee you'd get at least one season. All fighting games these days already work on one season of DLC once they finish production on the main game itself. And hey, this is a Turtles game. They've got a built-in audience. Mean that unless this game just failed on every level and was savaged in reviews, I'm pretty sure it would sell enough to get at least a few more seasons of DLC. In fact, looking over at another major fighting game based around a 90s nostalgia property, Power Rangers Battle for the Grid, that game has gotten four seasons of DLC and a few guest characters thrown in there. And the Ninja Turtles, as I said, popped up in Justice 2, and that game didn't have DLC seasons, more DLC packs, but it's still got three of those. 
However, this is something you may have noticed about those seasons and character packs. Normally when I do DLC in these videos, I like to have about six characters per season because that's about the average that most big mainstream fine games get, but both Battle for the Grid seasons and Injustice 2's character packs only had three characters each. So to try and keep this all fair, to try and inject a smidge of reality into all this, I'm going to give us three seasons of DLC today, but each season will only have four characters. Why four? Because it's the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Four is kind of the magic number. So let's get started with season one. First up, Slash, the Turtles' spikier, angrier doppelganger. When I was a kid, Slash was one of my favorite villains for the Turtles. What can I say? I was a kid in the 90s. Having angrier, spikier versions of heroes was all the rage back then. But over time, in multiple other interpretations, he's become a far more complicated and interesting character beyond just being the evil turtle. So I want to make sure to give him some love, however, A, as I pointed out before, we already had a lot of big tanky characters in the starting roster, and between Donnie, Raph, Leo, Mikey, and even to some extent Metalhead, we already had plenty of turtles in that starting roster. So yeah, to make sure that we aren't just loading the base roster up with too many big tanky characters or too many turtles, Slash just works way better for DLC. Next up, I want to get another character in here from the original Tournament Fires to help this game feel like it's continuing the legacy of that title. So let's go with Chrome Dome. He's one of the few characters from Tournament Fires to actually appear in the cartoon, so that already gives him some more credibility than, say, Sisyphus or War. Although I will give War some points for being one of the literal horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah, that old TMNT Archie comic got weird. Now, in the original game, Chrome Dome was just an evil robot working for Shredder, but in the cartoons, he was huge. I don't mean he was really popular, no, I mean he was a giant! And he appeared as one of the bosses in the recent Treasure Revenge game, where he had the ability to grow and start punching the stage. So, let's give him abilities and sewers that revolve around this size-changing ability. Maybe we could give him a special meter that builds up, and when you activate it, he temporarily increases in size, depending on how long that meter has been building up. So, so far in this DLC, we've got one Turtle stable character, then we've got one character from the classic cartoon to get some nostalgia love in here, so for the next character, let's bring in someone else from the IDW comics. Yes, I know I'm pulling a lot from those books, but seriously, read them. They're great and they've created a ton of excellent new characters for the Turtles. So I think we could actually include one original IDW character in every single season, so that way everyone picking up these season passes will get some familiar characters that they know, and then they'll get introduced to one brand new character. For season one, we'll go with Sally Pride. She's a lion mutant who was originally a member of Hobbs' crew, and originally I was going to save her to be one of his assists, but recently, not only did she quit the Mute Animals, she's actually become the central focus of the book's storyline at the moment, meaning she's gone from villain henchman to major player in the series. So yeah, let's give her a spot in the DLC and make her a brawler with some punishing punches. Plus, I won't lie, I'm partly just putting her on here because she kind of reminds me of Sheena from Bloody Roar, and Sheena from Bloody Roar was awesome. So, screw it! I put a character into the base roster just because they remind me of Sagat. I will put a character into the DLC just because they remind me of Sheena. We're in the DLC right now, there are no more rules at this point. And speaking of no more rules, you might have noticed I've pulled from a lot of different parts of the Turtles lore. The original cartoons, the comics, the games. But there's one part of the Turtles history that has sadly been absent from this video. Not that one, not that one, not that one, that one. Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes, the most recent Turtles series created an entire cast of brand new characters specifically for that show, and I haven't included any of them. Not because I dislike the show, no, not at all. I know that Rise of the TMNT when it was initially announced got a lot of the older fans upset because of how different it looked and because of how much it changed the characters around, but I thought the show was just fine, I enjoyed it. But the reason I haven't used anyone from that show is because, well, as I said, it was different from the other Turtle properties. Very different and it sadly had the shortest runtime, meaning it had the least time to impact the mythos. So, when trying to establish a unified theme and world for the Turtles for this game, sadly, it's the stuff that has the hardest time fitting in. At least for the starting roster. Now that we're on the DLC, as I always say, DLC is when you can just go nuts and break all the rules. So now all the Rise of the TMNT characters are on the table, so let's close out the first season of DLC with the original big bad guy from that show, Baron Draxum. 
I'd keep his armored look and give him plenty of specials where he shoots out his big otherworldly vines to smack you around, sort of making him a character that doesn't even have to move to fight you. He would just sort of stand there, menacingly like the big baddie that he is. And I do know that later in the series he actually became a good guy, but what can I say, I just like his villain look more. Although we can give him his later design as an unlockable costume. So that's it for season one. It brought in a few more fan favorites, a few more big names, and expanded the range of characters that we can use. So let's go ahead and continue that with season two. Let's kick things off with another character who was important to the original Tournament Fires, even if he's not the first name you think of when you picture that game. Hothead. I'll admit I did really like this guy when I was a kid. I mean, he's a big bad dragon man. How was a kid not supposed to like that? But also, as I said, he is important to the Tournament Fighter series. If you can call one game with three ports a series. You see, most people remember the great debate between the Super Nintendo and Genesis versions of Tournament Fighter, with each game having their own unique cast of characters, but few people remember that there was also a classic NES version, which only had the four turtles, Shredder, Casey Jones, and the one standout unique character, Hothead. They even put him right there on the box because... I mean, okay, there was zero competition for that spot, but still, it's kind of a big deal. So this would be a nice way of continuing the legacy of that series while fleshing out a character that some people probably remember, but they've still remained rather obscure. But if we got one obscure character, then we need another staple, another big important character, a character who has been in every single interpretation of the Turtles. I'm talking about Baxter Stockman. Yes, this super scientist has been a thorn in the Turtles' side ever since the original Mirage comics. He's a big name in this franchise. So why did I save him for DLC? Well, you should always save at least one or two big names for the DLC, so that way it feels like it still matters. But the main reason I'm saving him is because you also want to save your truly unique characters for DLC. You want your base roster to show off a wide range of playstyles that establish the limits of the game, then the DLC can break those limits. And I think Baxter Stockman would be perfect for that. Because the old school Turtle fans remember him as the guy who turned himself into a fly, but in most other interpretations, he's just a super scientist. In the 2003 cartoon, he was a tech genius piloting mechs. In the Rise of Cartoons, sure, he was a kid, but he was still piloting giant machines. And the IDW comics, he's literally just Lex Luthor. He's a super manipulative genius slowly taking over the world. So I'd say the version of Baxter Stockman that we have in this game be the super genius non-fly version, so he wouldn't really be that agile, he wouldn't be that strong, but he would specialize in keeping the opponent busy. Make Baxter Stockman a summoned fighter, and he could just summon out Robox soldiers to run across the stage and attack completely independently of him. Have his Mauser bots run across the stage to attack you low, have his robot fly mutants attack you from high. Being able to cover the field with multiple threats that your opponent has to focus on would more than make up for his weaker stats. And it would be a challenge for players who had already learned how to handle everything in the base roster. Kind of like Gargos from Killer Instinct, which is probably the only time anyone will ever compare Baxter Stockman to a character from Killer Instinct. Next again, I want to include another fighter from the IDW comics, so I'm going with Jenica. She was a character with a bad past who eventually joined the Foot Clan, only for Splinter to teach her how to use her ninja skills for good. Up until Karai tried to kill her, and the only way to save her was for the turtles to give her a blood transfusion, mutating her into another Ninja Turtle. I'm including her because A, she has become a huge part of the IDW series, having officially joined the turtles team, but also because the idea of creating the fifth turtle is nothing new. They've been attempting to create a fifth turtle ever since the early 90s. Originally, there was going to be a fourth movie that introduced a turtle named Kirby, named after legendary artist Jack Kirby, but that movie was cancelled. Then the next mutation introduced Venus de Milo, and the less said about the non-IDW, non-Frankenstein Venus de Milo, the better. But Jenica has been with the turtles in the comics for a few years now, and she's actually pretty cool. I still wouldn't put her in the main roster because you want people picking this game up to feel like they know what game they're getting, and if they see five turtles there on the cover, it would kind of confuse them. Sure, you could give the game a story mode that was all about Jenica being introduced as a brand new character and having her join the turtles, but then you have a story mode that isn't really about the Ninja Turtles, it's more about one Ninja Turtle, and you want your fighting game story mode to feel like it's kind of about everybody, not just one character. So yeah, it's just better that we save her for the DLC. Plus, again, like Slash, 
We already got four main turtles in that starting roster and a robot turtle. We put another one in that base roster, it's kind of pushing our limits. So that makes the DLC the perfect place to introduce older turtle fans to her. And we could make it so that when you play through Arcade Letter, every single character in this game has their own unique story mode in there. So again, if you don't know who Jenica is, that would be the perfect place to learn about her. As for how she'd fight, her weapon of choice is Claws, so we can make her a Rekka style fire, with tons of slash moves that can link into each other with various ways of ending or starting up brand new combos. And as for the final character of Season 2, we ended Season 1 with a newer Big Boss character, so let's end this season with a classic Big Boss character, Super Shredder. Yes, if you're an old school Turtles fan, you remember what a big deal it was when Shredder himself mutated into a big monster form in that second movie. And since then, this incarnation of the Shredder has continued to be a big threat for the Turtles in many other forms of media, including being the final boss in multiple video games, which is really the only reason that I would save him for DLC. Making him the final boss of this game would be kind of predictable, we've already seen that many times before. But maybe when this second season of DLC gets released, we could maybe introduce a secondary arcade ladder. You play through the very first arcade ladder, you get the original story for every single one of these characters when they go through the arcade mode, and then you end up going up against Rat King there at the end. But if you go into this second arcade mode, then you get some brand new story for every single one of the characters you're playing with a brand new ending, and then Super Shredder would be the big final boss of that arcade ladder. This is something that I've noticed a few fine games doing with their DLC, and I kind of dig it. I'm always for DLC, I new single player content, and I think this is a great idea. And that leads us to our final season of DLC, which means that now is our last chance to get in any major faces, as well as our last chance to throw in any big surprises. Hopefully I can pull that off as we move into... Season 3. We're going to kick things off with Big Mama, which was another one of the big recurring villains from Rise of the TMNT, organizing a lot of the mutant mayhem that was going on around the city, almost acting like a mob boss of sorts for the Turtles. She looks all dainty and elegant at first, so we would give her a lot of attacks that show off her more refined mannerisms, like simply swatting you away or calling on her assistants to run in an attack, but she'd also have a separate meter that builds up as she fights. And when it's full, you could transform into her big giant spider form with completely different and far more damaging attacks. Did I mention that I used to play a lot of Bloody Roar as a kid? Yeah, if there's a character who can transform into a giant angry animal form, I'm not saying they're a shoe in for this game, but I'm definitely going to consider them. Now, since this is our final season, we should probably include one more character from the original Tournament Fighters. I said we'd include Armagon because he was one of the faces of the original game, and I threw Hothead in because he too was another one of the characters that was on the box. So we got the NES and the SNES versions covered, but we need to get that Genesis cover in here to complete the trio. So let's throw in a Triceraton, the race of intergalactic conquerors who look like Triceratops. Listen, at this point, if you're shocked by anything from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles universe, then I don't know what to tell you. But we do have to pick an actual Triceraton. We can't just have a nameless space dino to represent them all. So let's go with Zog, since he's a recurring figure who tends to be important to the plot whenever he shows up. As for how he'd play, well, as I said with Baxter Stockman, the DLC is a great place to really push the limits of what you've already established. So we've had a lot of big tanky characters so far. So let's make Zog the most tanky of them all. Armor on almost everything, he hits like a truck, but he would be slow. Sure, we could give him a charge attack where he runs at you with his horns, but that's pretty much it for his mobility. I'm picturing something like Potemkin from Guilty Gear, where it would be kind of hard for him to get in on you, but once he gets in close, yeah, you'd be in trouble. But maybe we could also give him a blaster attack for some kind of a ranged option. Almost done, but before we go, I have to throw in one more character from the IDW comics, and I'm going with Koya. She's a mutant falcon who is one of the deadliest warriors in the Foot Clan, and even has big spectral wings to give her a very unique design. Koya would have a few flying abilities, sort of like Wingnut, and she would be super rush downy. I said Zog would be the most tanky character in the roster. Well, Koya would be the fastest. After all, falcons are the quickest animal on Earth, and Koya is quite vicious and hates staying around and waiting to attack. So, she'd get right up in the opponent's face, but birds aren't exactly known for their tough hides, so she would be sort of a glass cannon. I compared Zog to Potemkin from Guilty Gear, Koya would definitely be more like Chip. 
very fast, can get a lot of hits in at once, a lot of mobility, can attack you from almost anywhere, very hard to catch, but if you do hit her, that life bar is gone. And that brings us to our final character, and you know, once you get to the third and final season of DLC, I think it's safe to throw in a guest character. And I got one that would be perfect. I had a lot of people online asking me to include a guest character in this roster with multiple people throwing out Daredevil, which does kind of make sense. I mean, if you know your Turtles history, the comic that created them was meant to be a parody of Frank Miller's Daredevil run. Don't believe me? What's the name of the ninja clan that Daredevil fights? The Hand. Who the Turtles fight? The Foot. Who trained Daredevil? Stick. Who trained the Turtles? Splinter. Yeah, you get the idea. But as I said, I always like to be at least a little bit realistic in these videos, and when I think of who would probably be cool with loaning out one of their characters to be used as a guest fighter, Disney is not the company that comes to mind. Plus, if you're a longtime TMNT fan, then you know that there is a way better guest character to throw in here. Miyamoto Usagi. Usagi is the star of a long-running comic series, Usagi Yojimbo, created by the legendary Stan Sakai. It's a story of a wandering samurai in Japan, except it's set in a world where everyone is an anthropomorphic animal. So why am I proposing Usagi as the final DLC character? Because throughout the decades, both Usagi and the Turtles have had a long-running relationship. He has actually guest starred in every single Turtles series except for Rise, and if that show hadn't been cancelled, I can guarantee you he would've popped up eventually. It's a tradition for the Turtles to cross over with Usagi, so putting him in here as the final DLC character would kind of be a perfect way to end the game. And speaking of the end, that's where we are! Yes, folks, it took some time, but we made our way through a complete 22-character new TMNT Tournament Fire game and a full three seasons of DLC. Will we ever get another Tournament Fires? Who can say? It's possible. Turtles Nostalgia is pretty high right now, so I wouldn't rule it out. But even if it isn't possible, it was still fun taking a ride through the sewers of nostalgia today and exploring all the crazy turtle mutated madness out there. But what did you think? Did I leave off any big obvious picks? Any small obscure grabs? Where were Toka and Razor? Or Muckman? Or Ghost Bear? Or Don Tertelli? Okay, now you guys know I'm messing with you. Let me know all your thoughts down below, or you can always send me a tweet over at Thorgy's Arcade. And if you like this video, then have a look around our channel. We do lots of other fine game content here, like retrospectives and countdowns, so check those out, and if you like it, then make sure that you hit that thumbs up button and subscribe and ring that bell and do all that other stuff you gotta do down there. We're aiming to hit 50,000 subscribers by the end of the year, so again, if you like what you see, lend us some turtle power and help us out. Thanks for tuning in today, everyone. Stay safe out there, and one last time... Cowabunga!